Okay. All right. So uh, we got we talked about housing and housing projects and so forth yesterday. Uh, today we're going to start with the A A A. The Agricultural Adjustment Act creates the Agricultural Adjustment Administration. This is 1933. Okay. I'll get the lights a little off here for you so you can see that better. We know farmers are in trouble. We've lost a million family farms between 1930 and 1934. We've got the Dust Bowl. We've got low crop prices. We've got farmers that can't pay their, their loans back. Farmers are in trouble. So this is the goal here, guys, is to bring up farm income, uh, hopefully to levels pre-World War I, when farmers were doing pretty good. And the method they're going to use here is kind of interesting. Some of it may seem a little off the wall, like, Really, this is what we're going to do? Um, and some of it, guys, is just flat, plain, unconstitutional, okay, which will be a theme today. So the goal here is to reduce surpluses. We have too much food. So that means prices keep dropping. So if we get rid of the surplus, it should increase price. So we are going to limit production of wheat, corn, cotton, hogs, tobacco, and milk. Now, if you're a pig farmer or a cattle rancher, I mean, the cows, they got to be milked, right? If you don't milk them, they get infected and your, cat, your cows die. So what are you going to do with the milk? You're going to pour it down the drain. Okay. It's not going to go to market. It's not going to be used to make cheese or butter, milk products. You're going to pour it down the drain. Now, farmers are some of the hardest working people on the planet. So you're going to knock on their door, and we're going to tell them, hey, we don't want you to plant your crop this year. The farmer's like, what? You want me to plant my crops? How am I going to make a living? Oh, don't worry, sir. We're going to send you a cash bonus from the U.S. Treasury. We're going to pay you not to plant. Really? Okay. I guess you make the laws. You make the rules. Now, where are they going to get this money to pay farmers for not planting their crops? Well, we're going to create a new tax on manufacturers. So Henry Ford, he's a manufacturer, right? He makes cars. So we're going to tax Henry Ford a manufacturing processing tax in General Electric and General Motors and everybody else. The taxes from these manufacturers will be used to give money to the farmers for not planting. Now, Henry Ford is going to pass those taxes on to the consumer. So Ford Motor Vehicles will cost more, which, again, guys, we're trying to create inflation. We want prices to come up. This is one way to do it. Raise taxes. Now, spoiler alert. The Constitution of the United States does not give the power of the Congress to force a tax on one industry to use that money to give to another industry for not doing something. Now, you can tax the American people and give it to farmers, but you can't create a tax solely for the purpose on another industry for funding a different one. You follow me? The Supreme Court is going to strike this down. They're going to keep doing this. They're just going to have to figure out another way to fund it. Follow me? Now, so you pour the milk down the drain. What about the pigs? You can't let them grow up. 
Because when a pig grows up, it becomes rotund. We use the whole pig. Like, what, what do we get? What do we get from a pig? Bacon. That's always the first answer. <laughs> Bacon. What else? Pulled pork, ham, ribs, pork chops, pork tenderloin. You ever heard of pickled pig's feet? Yeah, that's a thing. Pig snout? What do we do with the pig ears? Give it to the dogs. Chew. Dogs chew them. What do we do with skin? Pork rinds. Like pork rinds? They're very low in carbohydrates. They don't have any carbohydrates. So you can, if you're on the keto diet, like I do sometimes, that's a good snack. You like crunchy stuff? You can't eat potato chips. Full of carbs. Pork rinds. You kind of get like over it real fast. Like after you eat a whole bag, you're like, I don't want any more pork rinds. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, what do we use the pig intestine for? Casing for sausage. You guys like sausage? I love sausage. I'm kind of a sausage connoisseur, actually. Kibasa. Right? Whole sausage, kibasa, bratwurst. Yeah, all that stuff. I could live off of that. Okay. Um, we used the whole pig. Whatever's left over, you know, yeah. Use it for pork hot dogs. You know, push it all together. Throw some preservatives in there. Hot dogs are nasty. Regrets, you can't let them grow up. So they go to the pig farmers and they say, look, you need to kill your pigs. They're going to slaughter six million baby pigs. They're going to knock on your door and say, sir, you need to kill those pigs. If you don't want to kill them, we'll kill them for you. I had a student in here whose grandparents that happened to during the Depression. Now, they paid you for it. You know what I mean? But you had to kill them. Any of you guys ever seen the movie Babe? It's like a kid's children's movie, Babe. Oh, it's so good. You know what? I mean? You missed this as a kid. Because I watched this with my kids when they were kind of. Um, yeah, it's about this pig that is the baby pig. He doesn't want to be eaten, so he wants. He has to prove value on the farm, and so they're sheepdogs, and so the pig becomes like a sheepdog, and the pig communicates with the sheep in a kind manner, so that the sheep will listen to him. And so the owner submits the pig for the sheepdog contest, the national sheepdog contest, and everybody thinks this guy's crazy because he's got a pig as a sheepdog, and he wins the contest. And he says at the end of the movie, that'll do, pig. Great movie. Okay. All right, sorry. I'm just trying to make you feel sorry for all these six million little pigs, okay, that they're going to slaughter. They're going to plow up 30% of the cotton that has been planted. Oh, you already planted your cotton? Uh, we're going to need you to till that up. Now, the Secretary of Agriculture, Henry A. Wallace, Secretary of A. Agriculture, who will later go on to become Roosevelt's second vice president, says this is the only way that farmers are going to earn enough to live. We talk about this, guys, like if there's a bumper crop of wheat or corn, in the United States, we have a ton of it. What happens to the price? Yeah, it goes down. Then you have a bad year where the yields are small. What happens to the price? But you don't have much to sell because you don't have a very high yield. It's a catch-22. So guys, from this point forward, 
We are going to see farmers in many ways in this country become dependent on government. Every 10 years, the U.S. Congress passes what's called the Farm Bill. Let me just look this up real quick. Farm Bill Talks. Okay. $205 billion over 10 years. Goes to our farmers. Okay. Now, is this going to work? We're going to bring farm income up? Yes, it's going to work. We are going to control the amount of food produced in the United States. So farm prices will, crop prices will rise rapidly, and farm income will rise 240%. Between 1932 and 1935. There are some farmers that receive no government subsidies, but most big farms do. Okay. Here's where I get off topic. Twenty twenty four. Is Joe Biden going to run for reelection? Probably not. How many of you think Joe Biden's going to run for reelection? You don't think he will? Why? Okay. So who who are the Democrats going to run? Kamala? Is she going to win? Can't. Oh, Hillary? Yeah. Bring Hillary back? Third time, four times charm. <laughs> okay. Who's going to run for the Republicans? Is Trump going to run? How many think Trump's going to run? 2024. Think he'll run? I think he'll run. <laughs> Just to be honest, I, you know, I don't hate Trump. I don't hate Biden. I hope neither of neither, neither them run. Personally, I think we got to move past it. Okay. Now, I, the, the economy under Trump was doing pretty damn good until COVID hit. I mean, things were going good in this country. I, I, I like the policies. Uh, but listen, um, this country's so freaking divided over this stuff. You know what I mean? It'd be nice if we could move past it a little bit. But we'll see what happens. But anyhow, guys, every presidential election cycle, I'm going to be talking about corn. Now, we grow a lot of corn in Kansas, though. But if you, any of you guys have ever been to Iowa, holy crap, dude. The whole state is freaking corn. They have like three or four big cities in the whole state. You know, that, that aren't really even that big. The, the whole state is corn. Like, you drive through, it's corn. Now, we have so much corn that we use it. Instead of eating some of it, we use it to make fuel. Yes? What's it called? Ethanol. Right? Now, ethanol clean, burns cleaner than gasoline. So we add that to our gasoline, and it, we're a little more environmentally friendly. The problem with ethanol, and we have an ethanol plant over here in Coleridge, you can't make a profit burning food unless you get subsidized by the government. So every presidential election cycle, there's going to be, you know, 12 to 15 Republicans, 12 to 15 Democrats vying if Biden doesn't run and Trump doesn't run. 
you'll have 12 or 15 Republicans and Democrats trying to become the nominee for the party. Yes? That process will begin in January of 2024 with what are called primary elections or caucuses. Now, guys, if you haven't registered to vote, or if you have, you cannot vote in these primary elections, which for Kansas will be in June of 2024, unless you register as a Republican or a Democrat. If you register as an independent, you don't get to play in this game because we're choosing a Republican or a Democrat to be the nominee of the party for president. Follow me? The first two states that get to do this every election cycle are Iowa and New Hampshire. You want to win Iowa. You want to win New Hampshire because you're, you're the front runner. You're going to be on the front page of every newspaper in America if you win the Iowa caucus. So these you know, 12 to 15 people of both parties are going to go to Iowa every four years, and they are going to bow at the altar of the corn farmer. I will promise you the subsidies that you need to grow all this corn and turn it into fuel. We will give you billions of dollars. Happens every time. Now, if you don't support these subsidies, guess what? You're not going to win in Iowa. And you want to win in Iowa. Biden finished third in Iowa. Biden, Biden finished third in New Hampshire. You know who won those states? Bernie Sanders. And then the Democratic Party started freaking out. They're like, Bernie Sanders is not electable in a general election, he's too radical. So the Democratic Party's like, we gotta find a moderate. Joe Biden's our moderate. The next state, South Carolina, okay? South Carolina saved Joe Biden's ass. South Carolina made Joe Biden president of the United States because he's gonna win that state. And from there, he'll go on to win the nomination. Now, how did he win South Carolina? James Clyburn, who is an African-American member of the House of Representatives from South Carolina, he's a black man, and there's a lot of black people in South Carolina. They said, we need to get behind Joe Biden. He told the voters of South Carolina, vote for Biden. And they did. Now, are there very many African Americans in Iowa? No. Now, if you know demographics of the two parties, right? So minorities, especially African Americans, vote heavily Democratic. Okay. For Hispanics, uh, more Democratic than Republican, but we're seeing shifts in that right now. When we talk about politics and government class, right, there's some really interesting things, shifts going on in this country as we speak. But <clears throat> so, Democrats, why, why are they starting in Iowa? Well, that's the tradition, okay? So, South Carolina goes to Biden, okay? Um, in Kansas, you can only vote. If you're a registered Republican, you can vote in the Republican primary. If you're a registered Democrat, you can vote in the Democratic primary. It's a closed state in Kansas. Some states, anybody can vote in either or both. So, like, if you're a Republican in New Hampshire, you could vote for in the Democratic primary and try and choose the candidate that's easiest to beat. You know, like sabotage. Most states have closed primaries. Some have open. So people, like, try and you know, mess with the system. So, in August, they have the conventions and actually nominate the person. So, by, throughout the year, we're figuring out who the candidates are going to be for the, two, the major parties. Does that make sense? Okay. And guys, you need Iowa. Now, you don't have to have it, but it helps. Okay. 
So, there you have it, guys. So, today, uh, we see a lot of subsidies for a lot of uh, farmers. Now, guys, I don't know how I feel about this. I, you know, I don't like big government. I don't like government spending $218 you know, billion or whatever it is. Um, we have made this decision as a nation. We're going to help our farmers. We're the breadbasket of the world. We make more food than anybody else on the planet. So we're going to help our farmers. Now, you guys are familiar. I mean, we do this with energy, too, especially green energy, right? Um, you know all the wind farms we have in, in Kansas, right? Do you think if Charles Koch of Koch Industries thought he could make money building windmills, he would do it? Of course he would. He'd buy the business, and he would make it better. But you can't make money off these wind farms. The government subsidizes the people that make the windmills. They subsidize the payments to the people that the property's on. I mean, it's, it's funded by the government. Okay? And we're doing this with solar panels as well. I mean, we subsidize these industries with our tax dollars. Okay? So, it's got, you know, there's a lot of power in Washington, D.C. with all this money that goes out to different groups. Okay? Not just, you might call it corporate welfare. Right? You guys know what welfare is. This is corporate welfare. All right, moving on to the NRA. This is not the National Rifle Association. This is the National Industrial Recovery Act. It's creating the National Recovery Administration. We're going to have parades. We're going to have beauty contests. We're going to have code books for every industry. Guys, this is, this is the one. Roosevelt Fields is going to get us out of the Depression. Okay? It's going to change the face of business in America. This is the one. The Blue Eagle of the NRA. I'm going to make a prediction. Not very good at predictions, but I'm going to make one. These will be your two candidates for the 2024 election. You know who these people are? No. You know who these people are? You know who these people are? Anybody? Okay. This is the governor of Florida. This is the governor of California. Historically, we elect governors. Okay, and vice presidents. Very rarely do we elect a member of Congress. Members of Congress have voting records. They're easy to criticize. Governors are chief executives like presidents are. So it makes sense. All right, back to this NRA crap. All right. The National Recovery Administration will be granted the power to develop these code books for industries. This is for the construction industry. This is for the retail trade industry. Every industry will have codes that they will have to run their businesses by. The National Recovery Administration is going to tell your business what you can produce, how much of it you can produce, what price you will sell it for. They will tell you how much you have to pay your employees. They will tell you how many hours your employees are allowed to work. 
and they will grant those employees with the guaranteed right to unionize. Say what, Mr. Ebright? Are you guys reading this? Are you seeing this with your own eyes? Is this the United States of America? Spoiler alert. You ready? This whole thing will be declared unconstitutional. Nowhere in the Constitution does it grant the government these kind of powers. Call this. Do we call this communism? Is the government taking over private property here? No, the company's still privately owned. It's just the government is managing it, directing it. The state is. So we can't call this communism. It's not socialism. Now there's a lot of socialism to be found in the new name. No question. All right, I'm breaking out the F word. What's the F word? Yeah, fascism. Wait a second, Mr. Ebert, are you calling are you calling Roosevelt a fascist? No, I'm not. Guys, remember, Germany was out of the depression by 1936. We would be in this thing into the war. Mussolini employed these tactics in Italy as did Hitler in Germany. By 1936, Germany had modernized their cities. There were no unemployed. He told the businesses, mostly construction, you're gonna hire these people. This is what you're gonna pay them. This is what you're gonna build me. You're gonna build me a highway system that the Romans would be envious of. Called the what? The Audubon, a highway system. Have you guys seen, been on the Audubon, driven on the Audubon, rid, ridden on it? Dude, in 99, I was driving on the Audubon. And I was in a little Peugeot manual, little Euro, Euro car. Okay? And I'm on the Audubon, hauling some ser serious kilometers per hour. And I'm getting passed. Mercedes, Mercedes, BMW, all of that. There are speed limits on the Audubon. But, dude, it's nice. It's wide open. You know, I spent a lot of time on I-70 last weekend, like 12 hours. Okay. Every time I leave Kansas and I come back, I'm like, man, I love Kansas. <laughs> It's so wide open. You can see everything. You go east, man. It's just like everything gets congested. You know, even in rural Illinois, where they grow a lot of corn. Okay, a lot of soybeans in Illinois. Man. I tell you what, there's good farming. In, you know, southern Indiana, southern Illinois. Uh, it's like Kansas, but it's hilly, and there's a lot of trees. And I feel claustrophobic. In the, in the highway, it, just, it shrinks. Everything shrinks. You get out here, everything just opens up. I like it. The Audubon was nice. And then in 1936, Hitler hosted the Berlin Olympics. Beautiful stadiums. No unemployed. No social problems. People are like, dude, this Hitler guy's got it going. Can we get some of that over here? Can we try some of the things he's doing? Because we're out of the Depression. Now, I know he doesn't like Jews, but, like, I don't even know any Jews. It doesn't really matter to me. <laughs> no, that's what people were saying. 
Any of you guys know who Ken Burns is? He's a film documentary maker. He did his most famous is the Civil War. He did a documentary. He did jazz, the history of jazz, history of baseball. Uh, his latest one is about the Holocaust. Guys. This just came out. It's on PBS now. And um, it, it, it focuses. Now, I haven't seen it. My wife told me about it. But she said there's a big focus on the media, the journal, journalism in the United States about the Holocaust. Like, people really didn't know what was going on with the Jews over there. Our media really didn't report on it. Not very much, especially the New York Times, which is our paper of record. So you can go back and read through it. There's not a lot of mention of what's going on over there. Kind of like today with the Uyghurs in China that are being enslaved by the Chinese and forced to do slave labor, of which we buy their products, import these products made from slave labor in China, and our media barely. You guys know that's going on, right? Have we talked? We have. Have we talked about this? What's going on over there with the Uyghurs? The Uyghurs are Muslim, Chinese Muslims, and they've rounded them up and they have them in camps right now as we speak. And they're making things like Nike shoes. I don't hear LeBron James complaining about that. It's all about the Benjamins, man. What happened to caring about human rights? You know what I'm saying? Our media is complicit in this. Look, Charles Lindbergh, most famous man in the world, likes the Germans, likes what they're doing. Their airplanes are pretty cool, man. This Luftwaffe thing that's going to set ablaze Europe in another couple of years. Okay, this is pretty cool. Joe Kennedy of the Kennedy plan. He was the U.S. ambassador to Britain. Britain's about to be attacked by Germany, and our ambassador over there is like, hey, no, we need to support the Germans, not the British. We had to recall it. A lot of support for the Germans in this country. Hell, there was a Nazi party in this country, and it wasn't that small. Guys, this was working for them. We're in a depression. People look to more radical ideas to get out of that situation so they can feed their families. Okay? Thankfully, this got in the way. And it gets in the way of a lot of things. Which is good, because it preserves our rights, our freedoms, our liberties. It restricts the power of government to dominate us. Dude, can you imagine owning a business? Now, if you were a big business, this is probably going to help you. If you're a small business, it's a lot easier for the government to control the you know, big industry and have them do the stuff. Well, well, the little guy gets kind of squeezed out. Okay. Now, I just said to you that all of this was declared unconstitutional. If this was declared unconstitutional, how do we have a minimum wage today? We have one, right? We have a national, yeah, and then states have their own, they can add on to it, okay? Well, the nine justices at the Supreme Court, there's nine, right? Everybody knows that, okay? How long did the justices on the Supreme Court uh, get to serve? For life. This is important. Our federal judges serve for life. So once who gets to appoint them? The president. And who has to approve them? The Senate. Okay. So that's in the Constitution. The president gets to pick federal judges. The Senate has to confirm them. The president gets to appoint his own cabinet. The Senate has to approve them. Okay. It's in the Constitution. Now. Once they get confirmed by the Senate, they are independent. They serve for life. They don't have to get elected or reelected. So their job is to interpret that document, the Constitution, and make sure that laws and actions don't violate it based on their reading of the Constitution. So, you know, some of these judges 
are what are called strict constructionists that believe we should stay by the letter of the law, and others are loose constructions that feel the Constitution is a living, breathing, changing document that changes with the time. But should we, we should interpret it differently in 2022 than we did in 1789. Okay. So, these nine justices that declared all this unconstitutional, are they still on the court? No, they're dead. There's new ones that interpret the Constitution differently. But that's not how the minimum wage changed. Here's how the minimum wage changed. These guys, on the next assignment I give you, which I'll wait till Monday, um, there's a question about this. Roosevelt and the Supreme Court are going to go head to head because this is like the thing he wants most. And they're saying no. So what's he want to do? He wants to do this. He wants to pack the court. He wants to add six new justices to make the Supreme Court 15. Who would get to choose those six judges? He would. We're not done. Not only pack the court, but we're going to put in a retirement. Seven. Seven. Two of the nine were 70 years old. They were about to lose their job. Now, that means Biden, not Biden, Roosevelt would be able to appoint eight of the 15 new justices, which is a what? A majority. What does the court need to make a ruling? A majority. Mr. Ebright, does this not smack of one branch of government trying to take over another branch of government? Does this not smack of dictatorship? Of course it does. People are outraged by this. Even many Democrats are outraged by this. But the threat of packing the court and putting this retirement age, these two old buggers are going to do this. They're going to switch their vote on the minimum wage. That's how we got the minimum wage. Political pressure from a powerful president that threatened to take away these two men's jobs during a depression. Newspaper headline, switch in time saves not. There's an old saying, a stitch in time saves nine, deals with sewing. So, like when you make nine loops and you got to get a stitch in there, or you know, it's going to unwrap. Okay. So, this becomes a famous thing. Now, if you've been paying attention, which most of you probably haven't, for the last couple of years, like this year, our U.S. Supreme Court overturned the decision from 1972, Roe versus Wade. There's been some other decisions that have made people angry, too, by this court presently. Court presently, which has nine, is a 6-3 conservative to liberal court. Now, Chief Justice John Roberts is somewhat of a moderate. He kind of swings back and forth a little. But generally, this is a conservative court. So when Biden was being elected, they were talking about if he's elected and the Democrats win the majority of the Senate, they would pack the court. In order to pack the court, they would need to change the rules of the Senate filibuster. 
but you may not know what that means. I'm not going to get into it. It takes too long to explain. We'll talk about it in government class. But changing 200 years of Senate rules of the filibuster, which would allow the Republicans to stop the packing of the court, change the rules of the Senate and pack the court, Joe Biden. Two Democratic senators, and I'm going to make them famous because they deserve to be. Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Christian Christian Cinema from Arizona said to Joe Biden in the Democratic leadership, we will not vote to change the filibuster and we will not vote to pack the court. Two senators standing in the way of that. That's it from this actually happening. Okay. Today. Right now. Okay. Because people are upset about this. Okay. This is why elections have consequences, guys. It is important who the President of the United States is, if nothing else, that they get to appoint Supreme Court justices and federal judges. Who controls the Senate is important because they're the ones that approve them or confirm them. Okay. So, why do we register to vote? Because we have a say in this. It's limited, but we have a say. Okay? Now, not sorry. Bell's about to ring. I'll put that back up tomorrow. But the guy that ran this program is a, is a former general, and he's not easy to get along with. And by the way, it's another H. We'll be up to six H's before it's all said and done. I got a Huey to introduce you in a little while as well. Okay. We'll have a Hugh, a Huey, uh, Harold, Harry, Henry. Have a good weekend. You too, guys. Be safe. Yeah. Check it out. It kind of has like some of the perspectives, like um, narrative stories from the. It's this column with the coast, I like that. I'll be talking about the first column. Oh, awesome. Earl Warren. Okay. Yeah, I think it'll work. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Have a good one. You too.